Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14 To the Reader Courteous Reader, God, I hope, hath put it into my heart to write unto thee another time, and that about matters of the greatest moment. For now we discourse not about things controverted among the godly, but directly about the saving or damning of the soul. Yea, moreover, this discourse is about the fewness of them that shall be saved, and it proves that many a high professor will come short of eternal life. Wherefore the matter must needs be sharp, and so disliked by some, but let it not be rejected by thee. The text calls for sharpness, so do the times. Yea, the faithful discharge of my duty towards thee hath put me upon it. I do not now pipe, but mourn. It will be well for thee if thou canst graciously lament. Matthew 11, verse 17 Some, say they, make the gate of heaven too wide, and some make it too narrow. For my part, I have here presented thee with as true a measure of it, as by the word of God I can. Read me, therefore, yea, read me, and compare me with the Bible. And if thou findest my doctrine, and that book of God, concur, embrace it, as thou wilt answer the contrary in the day of judgment. This awakening work, if God will make it so, was prepared for thee. If there be need, and it wounds, get healing by blood. If it disquiets, get peace by blood. If it takes away all thou hast, because it was not, for this book is not prepared to take away true grace from any, then buy of Christ gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness doth not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Revelation 3, verse 18 Self-flatteries, self-deceivings, are easy and pleasant, but damnable. The Lord give thee in heart to judge right of thyself, right of this book, and so prepare for eternity, that thou mayest not only expect entrance, but be received into the kingdom of Christ and of God. Amen. So praise thy friend, John Bunyan. The Straight Gate, or Great Difficulty of Going to Heaven Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. Luke 13, 24 These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and are therefore in a special manner to be heeded. Besides, the subject matter of the words is the most weighty, to wit, how we should obtain salvation, and therefore also to be heeded. The occasion of the words was a question which one that was at this time in the company of the disciples put to Jesus Christ. The question was this, Lord, are there few that be saved? Verse 24. A serious question, not such as tended to the subversion of the hearers, as too many nowadays do, but such as in its own nature tended to the awakening of the company to good, and that called for such an answer that might profit the people also. This question also well pleased Jesus Christ, and he prepareth and giveth such an answer as was without the least retort or show of distaste. Such an answer, I say, as carried in it the most full resolve to answer the question itself and help to the person's questioning. And he said unto them, Strive to enter in, etc. The words are an answer and an instruction also. Number one. An answer, and that in the affirmative. The gate is straight. Many that seek will not be able, therefore but few shall be saved. Number two. The answer is an instruction also. Strive to enter in, etc. Good counsel and instruction. Pray God help me and my reader and all that love their own salvation to take it. My manner of handling the words will be first by way of explication and then by way of observation. Roman numeral 1 By way of explication the words are to be considered first with reference to their general scope and then with reference to their several phrases. 
First, the general scope of the text is to be considered, and that is that great thing, salvation. For these words do immediately look at, point to, and give directions about salvation. Are there few that be saved? Strive to enter in at the straight gate. The words, I say, are to direct us not only to talk of or to wish for, but to understand how we shall and to seek that we may be effectually saved and therefore of the greatest importance. To be saved, what is like being saved? To be saved from sin, from hell, from the wrath of God, from eternal damnation, what is like it? To be made an heir of God, of his grace, of his kingdom and eternal glory, what is like it? And yet all this is included in this word, saved, and in the answer to that question, are there few that be saved? Indeed, this word saved is but of little use in the world, except to them that are heartily afraid of damning. This word lies in the Bible, as excellent salves lie in some men's houses, thrust into a hole, and not thought on for many months, because the household people have no wounds nor sores. In time of sickness, what so set by as the doctor's glasses and galley pots full of his excellent things? But when the person is grown well, the rest is thrown to the dunghill. Oh, when men are sick of sin and afraid of damning, what a text is that where this word saved is found? Yea, what a word of worth and goodness and blessedness is it to him that lies continually upon the wrath of a guilty conscience. But the whole need not the physician. He therefore, and he only, knows what saved means that knows what hell and death and damnation means. What shall I do to be saved is the language of the trembling sinner. Lord, save me is the language of the sinking sinner. And none admire the glory that is in that word saved, but such as see, without being saved, all things in heaven and earth are emptiness to them. They also that believe themselves privileged in all the blessedness that is wrapped up in that word, bless and admire God that hath saved them. Wherefore, since the thing intended, both in the question and the answer, is no less than the salvation of the soul, I beseech you to give the more earnest heed. Hebrews 21 But to come to the particular phrases in the words, and to handle them orderly in the words, I find four things. Number one, an intimation of the kingdom of heaven. Two, a description of the entrance into it. Three, an exhortation to enter into it and four, a motive to enforce that exhortation. Number one, an intimation of the kingdom of heaven. For when he saith, strive to enter in, and in such phrases there is supposed a place or state, or both, to be enjoyed. Enter in, enter into what, or whither, but into a state or place, or both. And therefore when you read this word, enter in, you must say there is certainly included in the text that good thing that yet is not expressed. Enter in, into heaven, that is the meaning, where the saved are and shall be. Into heaven, that place, that glorious place where God and Christ and angels are and the souls or spirits of just men made perfect. Enter in. That thing included, though not expressed in the words, is called in another place the Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven. Hebrews chapter 12. And therefore the words signify unto us that there is a state most glorious, and that when this world is ended, and that this place and state is likewise to be enjoyed and inherited by a generation of men forever. Besides this word, enter in, signifieth that salvation to the full is to be enjoyed only there, and that there only is eternal safety. All other places and conditions are hazardous, dangerous, full of snares, imperfections, temptations, and afflictions. But there all is well. There is no devil to tempt, no desperately wicked heart to deliver us up, no deceitful lust to entangle, nor any enchanting world to bewitch us. There all shall be well to all eternity. Further, all the parts of and circumstances that attend salvation are only there to be enjoyed. There only is immortality and eternal life. There is the glory and fullness of joy and the everlasting pleasures. There is God and Christ to be enjoyed by open vision and more. There are the angels and the saints. Further, there is no death, nor sickness, nor sorrow, nor sighing forever. 
There is no pain, nor persecutor, nor darkness to eclipse our glory. O oh, this Mount Zion, O oh, this heavenly Jerusalem. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 5. Psalm 16, verse 11. Luke 20, verses 35 and 36. And Hebrews 12, verses 12 through 14. Behold, therefore, what a great thing the Lord Jesus hath included by this little word, in. In this word is wrapped up an whole heaven and eternal life, even as there is also by other little words in the holy scriptures of truth, as where he saith, Knock, and it shall be opened unto you, and the elect have obtained it. This should teach us not only to read, but to attend in reading, not only to read, but to lift up our hearts to God in reading. For if we be not heedful, If he give us not light and understanding, we may easily pass over without any great regard such a word as may have a glorious kingdom and eternal salvation in the bowels of it. Yea, sometimes as here, a whole heaven is intimated where it is not at all expressed. The apostles of old did use to fetch great things out of the scriptures, even out of the very order and timing of the several things contained therein. See Romans 4 verses 9 through 11. Galatians 3:16 and 17 and Hebrews 8 verse 18. But number 2, as we have here an intimation of the kingdom of heaven, so we have a description of the entrance into it, and that by a double similitude. Number 1, it is called a gate. Number 2, a straight gate. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. First, it is set forth by the similitude of a gate. A gate, you know, is of double use. It is to open and shut, and so consequently to let in or keep out, and to do both these at the season, as he said, Let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened till the sun be hot. And again, I commanded that the gate should be shut, and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. Nehemiah 7 verse 3 and chapter 13 verses 19 and 20. And so you find of this gate of heaven, When the five wise virgins came, the gate was opened, but afterwards came the other virgins, and the door was shut. Matthew 11 So then the entrance into heaven is called a gate, to show that there is a time when there may be entrance, and there will come a time when there shall be none. And indeed this is a chief truth contained in that text. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. I read in the scriptures of two gates or doors through which they that go to heaven must enter. Number one, there is the door of faith, the door which the grace of God hath opened to the Gentiles. This door is Jesus Christ, as also himself doth testify, saying, I am the door, and etc. Acts chapter 14, verse 27, and John 10, verse 9. By this door men enter into God's favor and mercy and find forgiveness through faith in his blood and live in hope of eternal life. And therefore himself also said, I am the door. By me if any man enter in he shall be saved. That is, receive to mercy and inherit eternal life. But, number two, there is another door or gate. For that which is called in the text a gate is twice in the next verse called a door. That is, I say, another gate and that is the passage into the very heaven itself, the entrance into the celestial mansion house. And that is the gate mentioned in the text, and the door mentioned twice in the verse that follows. And thus Jacob called it when he said, Bethel was the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven, that is the entrance, for he saw the entrance into heaven. One end of Jacob's ladder stands in Bethel, God's house, and the other end reaches up to the gate of heaven. Genesis 28, verses 10 through 18. Jacob's ladder was the figure of Christ, which ladder was not the gate of heaven, but the way from the church to that gate, which he saw above at the top of the ladder. Genesis 28, verse 12, and John chapter 1, verse 51. But again, that the gate in the text is the gate or entrance into heaven, consider, number one, It is that gate that letteth men into, or shutteth men out of that place or kingdom where Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is, which place is that paradise where Christ promised the thief that he should be that day, that he asked to be with him in his kingdom. It is that place into which Paul said he was caught when he heard words unlawful or impossible for a man to utter. 
Luke 13, verse 20, and chapter 23, verse 24, and 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 6. Question. But is not Christ the gate or entrance into this heavenly place? Answer. He is he without whom no man can get thither, because by his merits men obtain that world, and also because he, as the Father, is the donor and disposer of that kingdom to whom he will. Further, this place is called his house, and himself the master of it. When once the master of the house is risen up, and has shut the door, verse 25. So we used to say that the master of the house is not the door. Men enter into heaven, then, by him, not as he is the gate or door or entrance, into the celestial mansion house, but as he is the giver and disposer of that kingdom, to them whom he shall count worthy, because he hath obtained it for them. Number two, that this gate is the very passage into heaven. Consider the text has special reference to the day of judgment, when Christ will have laid aside his mediatory office, which before he exercised for the bringing to the faith his own elect, and will then act not as one that justifieth the ungodly, but as one that judges sinners. He will now be risen up from the throne of grace and shut up the door against all the impenitent, and will be set upon the throne of judgment, from thence to proceed with ungodly sinners. Objection. But Christ bids strive. Strive now to enter in at the straight gate. But if that gate be, as you say, the gate or entrance into heaven, then it should seem that we should not strive till the day of judgment, for we shall not come at that gate till then. Answer. Christ, by this exhortation, strive, etc., does not at all admit of or continuance delays or that a man should neglect his own salvation, but putteth poor creatures upon preparing for the judgment, and counsels them now to get those things that will then give them entrance into glory. This exhortation is much like these. Be ye therefore ready also, for at such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Matthew 24, 44, and 25, verse 10. So that when he saith, Strive to enter in, it is as much as if he should say, Blessed are they that shall be admitted another day to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But they that shall be accounted worthy of so unspeakable a favor must be well prepared and fitted for it beforehand. Now the time to be fitted is not the day of judgment, but the day of grace. Not then, but now. Therefore strive now for those things that will then give you entrance into the heavenly kingdom. But secondly, as it is called a gate, so it is called a straight gate. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. The straightness of this gate is not to be understood carnally, but mystically. You are not to understand it as if the entrance into heaven was some little pinching wicket. No, the straightness of this gate is quite another thing. This gate is wide enough for all them that are the truly gracious and sincere lovers of Jesus Christ but so straight as that not one of the other can by any means enter in. Open to me the gates of righteousness, I will go into them, and I will praise the Lord, this gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. Psalm 118, verses 19 and 20. By this word, therefore, Christ Jesus has showed unto us that without due qualifications there is no possibility of entering into heaven the straight gate will keep all others out. When Christ spake this parable, he had doubtless his eye upon some passage or passages of the Old Testament with which the Jews were well acquainted. I will mention two and so go on. Number one, the place by which God turned Adam and his wife out of paradise. Possibly our Lord might have his eye upon that, for though that was wide enough for them to come out at, yet it was too straight for them to go in at. But what should the reason of that be? Why they had sinned, and therefore God set at the east of that garden cherubims and a flaming sword, turning every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Genesis 3.24 The cherubims and this flaming sword, they made the entrance too straight for them to enter in. Souls, there are cherubims and a flaming sword at the gates of heaven to keep the way of the tree of life. Therefore none but them that are duly fitted for heaven can enter in at this straight gate. The flaming sword will keep all others out. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, 
neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Number 2. Perhaps our Lord might have his eye upon the gates of the temple when he spoke this word unto the people. For though the gates of the temple were six cubits wide, yet they were so straight that none that were unclean in anything might enter in thereat. Ezekiel 40, verse 48. Because there were placed at them gates porters, whose office was to look that none but those that had right to enter might go in thither. And so it is written, Joadiah set porters at the gates of the house of the Lord, that none that were unclean in anything might enter in. Second Chronicles 23, verse 19. Souls, God hath porters at the gates of the temple, at the gate of heaven. Porters, I say, placed there by God, to look that none that are unclean in anything may come in thither. In at the gate of the church none may enter now that are open, profane, and scandalous to religion. No, though they plead, they are beloved of God. What hath my beloved to do in mine house, saith the Lord, seeing she hath wrought lewdness with many? Jeremiah 11, verse 15. I say I am very apt to believe that our Lord Jesus Christ had his thoughts upon these two texts when he said, The gate is straight. And that which confirms me the more in this thing is this, a little below the text he saith, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of heaven and you yourselves thrust out. Verse 28 Thrust out, which signifies a violent act, resisting with striving those that would, though unqualified, enter. The porters of the temple were, for this very thing, to wear arms, if need were, and to be men of courage and strength, lest the unsanctified or unprepared should by some means enter in. We read in the book of Revelations of the holy city and that it had twelve gates and at the gates twelve angels. But what did they do there? Why amongst the rest of their service this was one thing that there might in no wise enter in anything that defileth or worketh abomination and that maketh a lie. Revelation 21 verses 12 and 21 but more particularly, to show what it is that maketh this gate so straight, there are three things that maketh it straight. Number one, there is sin. Number two, there is the word of the law. Number three, there are the angels of God. First, there is sin, the sin of the profane and the sin of the professor. Number one, the sin of the profane. But this needs not be enlarged upon, because it is concluded upon at all hands where there is the common belief of the being of God and the judgment to come, that the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Psalm 9, verse 17. Number 2. But there is the sin of professors, or take it rather thus, there is a profession that will stand with an unsanctified heart and life. The sin of such will overpoise the salvation of their souls, the sin end being the heaviest end of the scale. I say that being the heaviest end which hath sin in it, they tilt over, and so are, notwithstanding their glorious profession, drowned in perdition and destruction. For none such hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Therefore let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience neither will a profession be able to excuse them. Ephesians 5, verses 3 through 6 The gate will be too straight for such as these to enter in thereat. A man may partake of salvation in part, but not of salvation in whole. God saved the children of Israel out of Egypt, but overthrew them in the wilderness. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believe not. So we see that notwithstanding their beginning, they could not enter in because of unbelief. Jude 5 and Hebrews 3 verse 19. Secondly, there is the word of the law, and that will make the gate straight also. None must go in thereat, but those that can go in by the leave of the law. For though no man be or can be justified by the works of the law, 
Yet unless the righteousness and holiness by which they attempt to enter into this kingdom be justified by the law, it is in vain once to think of entering in at this straight gate. Now the law justifieth not, but upon the account of Christ's righteousness. If therefore thou be not indeed found in that righteousness, thou wilt find the law lie just in the passage into heaven to keep thee out. Every man's work must be tried by fire, that it may be manifest of what sort it is. There are two errors in the world about the law. One is, when men think to enter in at the straight gate by the righteousness of the law. The other is, when men think they may enter into heaven without the leave of the law. Both these, I say, are errors. For as by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified, so without the consent of the law no flesh shall be saved. Heaven and earth shall pass away before one jot or tittle of the law shall fail, till all be fulfilled. He therefore must be damned that cannot be saved by the consent of the law. And indeed this law is the flaming sword that turneth every way, yea, that lieth to this day in the way to heaven, for a bar to all unbelievers and unsanctified professors. For it is taken out of the way for the truly gracious only. It will be found as a roaring lion to devour all others. Because of the law, therefore, the gate will be found too straight for the unsanctified to enter in. When the apostle had told the Corinthians that the unrighteous should not inherit the kingdom of God, and that such were some of them, he adds, But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9-11 closely concluding that had they not been washed and sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, the law for their transgressions would have kept them out. It would have made the gate too straight for them to enter in. Thirdly, there are also the angels of God, and by reason of them the gate is straight. The Lord Jesus calleth the end of the world his harvest, and saith, moreover, that the angels are his reapers, these angels are therefore to gather his wheat into his barn, but to gather the ungodly into bundles to burn them. Matthew 13, verses 39, 41, and 49. Unless therefore the man that is unsanctified can master the law and conquer angels, unless he can, as I may say, pull them out of the gateway of heaven, himself is not to come thither forever. No man goeth to heaven but by the help of the angels, I mean at the day of judgment. For the Son of Man shall send forth his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. If those that shall enter in at the straight gate shall only enter in thither by the conduct of holy angels, pray when do you think those men will enter in thither concerning whom the angels are commanded to gather them, to bind them in bundles, to burn them? This therefore is a third difficulty. The angels will make this entrance straight, yea, too straight for the unjustified and unsanctified to enter in thither. Number three. I come now to the exhortation which is to strive to enter in. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. These words are fitly added, for since the gate is straight, it follows that they who will enter in must strive. Strive. This word strive supposes, number one, that great idleness is natural to professors. They think to get to heaven by lying as it were on their elbows. Number two, it also suggests that many will be the difficulties that professors will meet with before they get to heaven. Number three, it also concludes that only the laboring Christian, man or woman, will get in thither, strive, etc. Three questions I will propound upon the word, an answer to which may give us light into the meaning of it. Number one, what does the word strive import? How should we strive? And three, why should we strive? Number one, what does this word strive import? Answer, when he saith strive, it is as much to say, bend yourselves to the work with all your might. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. Ecclesiastes 9.10 Thus Samson did when he set himself to destroy the Philistines. He bowed himself with all his might. Judges 16 verse 30 Thus David did also when he made provision for the building and beautifying of the temple of God. 
1 Chronicles 29 verse 2 And thus must thou do, if ever thou enterest into heaven. Secondly, when he saith strive, he calleth for the mind and will that they should be on his side and on the side of the things of his kingdom. For none strive indeed, but such as have given the Son of God their heart, of which their mind and will are a principal part. For saving conversion lieth more in the turning of the mind and will to Christ and to the love of his heavenly things than in all knowledge and judgment. And this the apostle confirms when he saith, Stand fast in one spirit and one mind, striving, etc. Philippians 1, 27. Number 3. And more particularly, this word strive is expressed by several other terms. As number 1, it is expressed by that word, So run that you may obtain. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 and 25. Number 2. It is expressed by that word, Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold of eternal life. 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. Number 3. It is expressed by that word, Labor not for the meat that perishes, but for that meat that endureth to everlasting life. John 6, 27. Number 4. It is expressed by that word, We wrestle with principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. Ephesians 6, verse 12. Therefore, when he saith, Strive, it is as much as to say, Run for heaven, fight for heaven, labor for heaven, wrestle for heaven, or you are like to go without it. The second question is, How should we strive? Answer. The answer in general is, Thou must strive lawfully. And if a man also strive for the mastery, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. 2 Timothy 6. But will you say, what is it to strive lawfully? Answer, number one, to strive against the things which are abhorred by the Lord Jesus, yea, to resist to the spilling of your blood, striving against sin. Hebrews 12, verse 4. To have all those things that are condemned by the word, yea, though they be thine own right hand, right eye, or right foot, in abomination, and to seek by all godly means the utter suppressing of them. Mark 9, verses 43, 45, and 47. Number 2. To strive lawfully is to strive for those things that are commanded in the word. But thou, O man of God, fly the world and follow after, that is, strive for, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, etc. 1 Timothy 6, verses 11 and 12. Number three, he that striveth lawfully must be therefore very temperate in all the good and lawful things of this life. And every one that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. 1 Corinthians 9.25 Most professors give leave to the world and the vanity of their hearts to close with them and to hang about their necks and make their striving to stand rather in an outcry of words then a hearty labor against the lusts and love of the world and their own corruptions. But this kind of striving is but a beating of the air and will come to just nothing at last. 1 Corinthians 9, 26 Number 4 He that striveth lawfully must take God in Christ along with him to the work, otherwise he will certainly be undone. Whereunto, said Paul, I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Colossians 1.29 And for the right performing of this, he must observe these following particulars. Number one, he must take heed that he doth not strive about things or words to no profit, for God will not then be with him. Of these things, saith the apostle, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. 1 Timothy 2.14 but alas, how many professors in our days are guilty of this transgression, whose religion stands chiefly, if not only, in a few unprofitable questions and vain wranglings about words and things to no profit, but to the destruction of the hearers. Number two. He must take heed that while he strives against one sin, he does not harbor and shelter another, or that while he cries out against other men's sins, he does not countenance his own. Number three, 
In the striving, strive to believe, strive for the faith of the gospel. For the more we believe the gospel and the reality of the things of the world to come, with the more stomach and courage shall we labor to possess the blessedness. Philippians 1.27 and Hebrews chapter 4 Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Number 4 As we should strive for and by faith, so we should strive by prayer. Romans 15 verse 30 By fervent and effectual prayers. O the swarms of our prayerless professors, what do they think of themselves? Surely the gate of heaven was heretofore as wide as in these our days. But what striving by prayer was there then among Christians for the thing that gives admittance into this kingdom over what there is in these latter days? Number 5. We should also strive by mortifying our members that are upon the earth. I therefore so run, said Paul, so fight I, not as one that beats the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached the gospel to others, I myself should be a castaway. 1 Corinthians 9.27 But all this is spoken principally to professors, so I would be understood. I come now to the third question, namely, but why should we strive? Answer number one. Because the thing for which you are here exhorted to strive is worth the striving for. It is for no less than for all the whole heaven and an eternity of felicity there. How will men that have before them a little honor, a little profit, a little pleasure strive? I say again, how will they strive for this? Now they do it for a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Methinks this word heaven and this eternal life ought verily to make us strive, for what is there again either in heaven or earth like them to provoke a man to strive? Number two. Strive because otherwise the devil and hell will assuredly have thee. He goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5 verse 8. These fallen angels, they are always watchful, diligent, unwearied. They are also mighty, subtle, and malicious, seeking nothing more than the damnation of thy soul. O thou that art like the heartless dove, strive. Number three, strive because every lust strives and wars against thy soul. The flesh lusts against the spirit. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, said Peter, as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Galatians 5 verse 17 It is a rare thing to see or find out a Christian that indeed can bridle his lust, but no strange thing to see such professors that are not only bridled, but saddled too, yea, and ridden from lust to sin, from one vanity to another, by the very devil himself and the corruptions of their hearts. Number four. Strive, because thou hast a whole world against thee, The world hateth thee if thou be a Christian. The men of the world hate thee. The things of the world are snares for thee. Even thy bed and table, thy wife and husband, yea, the most lawful enjoyments, have that in them that will certainly sink thy soul to hell, if thou dost not strive against the snares that are in them. Romans 11 verse 9 The world will seek to keep thee out of heaven with mocks, flounts, taunts, threatenings, gowls, gibbets, altars, burnings, and a thousand deaths. Therefore, strive. Again, if it cannot overcome thee with these, it will flatter, promise, allure, entice, entreat, and use a thousand tricks on this hand to destroy thee. And observe, many that have been stout against the threats of the world have yet been overcome with the bewitching flatteries of the same. There ever was enmity between the devil and the church, and betwixt his seed and her seed too, Michael and his angels, and the dragon and his angels, these make war continually. Genesis 3 and Revelation chapter 12 There have been great desires and endeavors among men to reconcile these two in one, to wit the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, but it could never yet be accomplished. The world says they will never come over to us, and we again say, by God's grace, we will never come over to them. But the business hath not ended in words. Both they and we have also added our endeavors to make each other submit. But endeavors have proved ineffectual too. 
They, for their part, have devised all manner of cruel torments to make us submit, as slaying with the sword, stoning, sawing asunder, flames, wild beasts, banishments, hunger, and a thousand miseries. We again on the other side have labored by prayers and tears, by patience and long suffering, by gentleness and love, by sound doctrine and faithful witness bearing against their enormities to bring them over to us. But yet the enmity remains, so that they must conquer us or we must conquer them. One side must be overcome, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. One side must be overcome, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Number five. Strive, because there is nothing of Christianity got by idleness. Idleness clothes a man with rags, and the vineyard of the slothful is grown over with nettles. Proverbs 23, 21, and 24, verses 30 through 32. Profession that is not attended with spiritual labor cannot bring the soul to heaven. The fathers before us were not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Therefore be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Romans 12:11 and Hebrews 6, verse 12. Strive to enter in. Methinks the words at the first reading do intimate to us that the Christian, in all that he ever does in this world, should carefully heed and regard his soul. I say, in all that he ever does. Many are for their souls by fits and starts. But a Christian indeed, in all his doing and designs which he contriveth and manageth in this world, should have a special eye to his own future and everlasting good. In all his labors he should strive to enter in. Wisdom, Christ, is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom, and in all thy gettings get understanding. Proverbs 4, verse 7 Get nothing if thou canst not get Christ and grace and further hopes of heaven in that getting. Get nothing with a bad conscience, with the hazard of thy peace with God, and that in getting it thou weakenest thy graces which God hath given thee. For this is not to strive to enter in. Add grace to grace, both by religious and worldly duties, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1, verses 8-12 through 12. Religious duties are not the only striving times. He that thinks so is out. Thou mayest help thy faith and thy hope in the godly management of thy calling, and mayest get farther footing in eternal life by studying the glory of God in all thy worldly employment. I am speaking now to Christians that are justified freely by grace, and am encouraging, or rather counseling them, to strive to enter in. For there is an entering in by faith and good conscience now, as well as our entering in body and soul hereafter. And I must add that the more common it is to thy soul to enter in now by faith, the more steadfast hope shalt thou have of entering in hereafter in body and soul. Strive to enter in. By these words also the Lord Jesus giveth sharp rebuke to those professors that have not eternal glory, but other temporal things in their eye, by all the bustle that they make in the world about religion. Some there be, what a stir they make, what a noise and clamor with their notions and forms, and yet perhaps all is for the loaves, because they have eaten of the loaves and are filled. John 6.26 They strive indeed to enter, but it is not into heaven. They find religion hath a good trade at the end of it, or they find that it is the way to credit, repute, preferment, and the like, and therefore they strive to enter into these. But these have not the straight gate in their eye, nor yet in themselves have they love to their poor and perishing souls. Wherefore this exhortation nippeth such by predicting of their damnation. Strive to enter in. These words also sharply rebuke them who content themselves as the angel of the church of Sardis did, to wit, they have a name to live and be dead. Revelation 3.1 Or as they of the Laodiceans, who took their religion upon trust and was content with a poor, wretched, lukewarm profession. For such as these do altogether unlike to the exhortation in the text that says, Strive, and they sit and sleep. That says, Strive to enter in, and they content themselves with a profession that is never like to bring them thither. Strive to enter in. Further, these words put upon us 
proving the truth of our graces now. I say they put us upon the proof of the truth of them now, for if the straight gate be the gate to heaven, and yet we are to strive to enter into it now, even while we live, and before we come thither, then doubtless Christ means by this exhortation that we should use all lawful means to prove our graces in this world, whether they will stand in the judgment or no. Strive to enter in. Get those graces now that will prove true graces then, and therefore try them you have. And if upon trial they prove not right, cast them away, and cry for better, lest they cast thee away, when better are not to be had. Buy of me gold tried in the fire. Mark that, Revelation 3.18 Buy of me faith and grace that will stand in the judgment. Strive for that faith. Buy of me that grace and also white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy wickedness doth not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Mind you this advice, this is right striving to enter in. But you will say, how should we try our graces? Would you have us run into temptation to try if they be sound or rotten? Answer. You need not run into trials. God hath ordained that enough of them shall overtake thee to prove thy graces, either rotten or sound, before the day of thy death. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof, if thou hast but a sufficiency of grace to withstand. I say thou shalt have trials enough overtake thee, to prove thy grace is sound or rotten. Thou mayest therefore, if God shall help thee, see how it is like to go with thee before thou goest out of this world, to wit whether thy graces be such as will carry thee in at the gates of heaven, or no. But how shall we try our graces now? Answer. How dost thou find them in outward trials? See Hebrews 11, verses 15 and 16. How dost thou find thyself in the inward workings of sin? Romans 7, 24. How dost thou find thyself under the most high enjoyment of grace in this world? Philippians 3, 14. But what do you mean by these three questions? Answer. I mean graces show themselves at these their seasons whether they be rotten or sound. How do they show themselves to be true under the first of these? Answer. By mistrusting our own sufficiency, by crying to God for help, by desiring rather to die than to bring any dishonor to the name of God, and by counting that if God be honored in the trial, thou hast gained more than all the world could give thee. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12, and chapter 14, verse 11, Acts 4, and chapter 20, verse 22, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 17 and 18, and Hebrews 11, verses 24 and 25. Question. How do they show themselves to be true under the second? Answer. By mourning and confessing and striving and praying against them. By not being content, shouldst thou have heaven, if they live and defile thee. And by counting of holiness the greatest beauty in the world, and by flying to Jesus Christ for life. Zechariah 12.10 John 19 Hebrews 12 verse 4 and Psalm 19 verse 12 Question How do they show themselves to be true under the third? Answer By prizing the true graces above all the world, by praying heartily that God will give thee more, by not being content with all the grace thou canst be capable of enjoying on this side of heaven and glory. Psalm 84, verse 10, Luke 17, verse 5, and Philippians chapter 3. Strive to enter in. The reason why Christ addeth these words to enter in is obvious, to wit, because there is no true and lasting happiness on this side of heaven. I say none that is both true and lasting. I mean as to our sense and feeling, as there shall. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Hebrews 13, verse 14. The heaven is within. Strive therefore to enter in. The glory is within. Strive therefore to enter in. The Mount Zion is within. Strive therefore to enter in. The heavenly Jerusalem is within. Strive therefore to enter in. Angels and saints are within. Strive therefore to enter in. And to make up all, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and that glorious Redeemer is within. Strive, therefore, to enter in. Strive to enter in. 
for without are dogs, sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Without are also the devils, and hell, and death, and all damned souls. Without is howling, weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. Yea, without are all the miseries, sorrows, and plagues that an infinite God can in justice and power inflict upon an evil and wicked generation. Strive therefore to enter in at the straight gate. Revelation 22 verse 15 Matthew 25 verse 41 Revelation 12 verse 9 Isaiah 65 verses 13 and 14 Matthew 22 verse 13 and Deuteronomy 29 verses 18 and 20 Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. Number four. We are now come to the motive which our Lord urges to enforce his exhortation. He told us before that the gate was straight. He also exhorted us to strive to enter in thereat, or to get those things now that will further our entrance then, and to set ourselves against those things that will hinder our entering in. In this motive, there are five things to be minded. Number one, that there will be a disappointment to some at the day of judgment. They will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Number two, that not a few but many will meet with this disappointment. For many will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Number three, this doctrine of the miscarriage of many then, it standeth upon the validity of the word of Christ. For many, I say, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. Number four. Professors shall make a great heap among the many that shall fall short of heaven. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. Number five. Where grace and striving are wanting now, seeking and contending to enter in will be unprofitable then. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. But I will proceed in my former method, to wit, to open the words unto you. For many, etc. If he had said, For some will fall short, it had been a sentence to be minded. If he had said, For some that seek will fall short, it had been very awakening. But when he saith, Many, many will fall short, yea, many among professors will fall short, this is not only awakening, but dreadful. For many, etc. I find this word, many, variously applied in Scripture. Number one, sometimes it intends the openly profane, the wicked and ungodly world, as where Christ saith, Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Matthew 7 verse 13 I say by the many here, he intends those chiefly that go on in the broad way of sin and profaneness bearing the tokens of their damnation in their foreheads, those whose daily practice proclaims that their feet go down to death and their steps take hold of hell. Job 21, verses 29 and 30, and Isaiah 3, verse 9, and Proverbs chapter 4. Number 2. Sometimes this word many intendeth those that cleave to the people of God deceitfully and in hypocrisy, or as Daniel hath it, Many shall cleave unto the church with flatteries. Daniel 11, verse 34. The word many in this text includes all those who feign themselves better than they are in religion. It includes, I say, those that have religion only for an holy day suit to set them out at certain times and when they come among suitable company. Number three. Sometimes this word many intends them that apostatize from Christ such as for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away, as John saith of some of Christ's disciples. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. John 6:65. 6, Number 4. Sometimes this word many intends them that make a great noise and do many things in the church and yet want saving grace. Many, saith Christ, will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, Have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Mark, there will be many of these. Number five. Sometimes this word many intends those poor, ignorant, deluded souls that are led away with every wind of doctrine. 
those who are caught with the cunning and crafty deceiver who lieth in wait to beguile unstable souls. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Second Peter 2 verse 2 Number 6 Sometimes this word many includes all the world, good and bad. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to everlasting shame and contempt. Daniel 12 verse 2 Compare with John chapter 5 verses 28 and 29. Number 7 Lastly, sometimes this word many intends the good only, even them that shall be saved. Luke 1 verse 10 and chapter 2 verse 34. Since the word is so variously applied, let us inquire how it must be taken in the text. And, number one, it must not be applied to the sincerely godly, for they shall never perish. John 10 verses 27 and 28. Number two, it cannot be applied to all the world, for then no flesh should be saved. Number three, neither is it to be applied to the open profane only, for then the hypocrite is by it excluded. Number four, but by the word many in the text our Lord intends in special the professor. The professor, I say, how high soever he seems to be now, that shall be found without saving grace in the day of judgment. Now that the professor is in special intended in this text, consider, so soon as the Lord had said, many will seek to enter in and shall not be able. He points, as with his finger, at the many that then he in special intends, to wit, them among whom he had taught, them that had eaten and drunken in his presence, them that had prophesied and cast out devils in his name, and in his name had done many wonderful works. Luke chapter 23 verse 26 and Matthew 7 verse 27. These are the many intended by the Lord in this text, though others also are included under the sentence of damnation by his word in other places. For many, etc., Matthew saith, concerning this straight gate, that there are but few that find it. But it seems the castaways in my text did find it, for you read that they knocked at it and cried, Lord, open unto us. So then the meaning may seem to be this, many of the few that find it will seek to enter in and shall not be able. I find at the day of judgment some will be crying to the rocks to cover them, and some at the gates of heaven for entrance. Suppose that those that cry to the rocks to cover them are they whose conscience will not suffer them once to look God in the face because they are fallen under present guilt and the dreadful fears of the wrath of the Lamb. Revelation 6 verse 16 And that those that stand crying at the gate of heaven are those whose confidence holds out to the last even those whose boldness will enable them to contend even with Jesus Christ for entrance. Them I say that will have profession, casting out his devils, and many wonderful works to plead. Of this sort are the many in my text. For many I say unto you will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. For many, etc. Could we compare the professors of the times with the everlasting word of God, this doctrine would more easily appear to the children of men. How few among the many, yea, among the swarms of professors, have heart to make conscience of walking before God in this world and to study his glory among the children of men. How few, I say, have his name lie nearer their hearts than their own carnal concerns. Nay, do not many make his word and his name and his ways a stalking horse to their own worldly advantages. God calls for faith, good conscience, moderation, self-denial, humility, heavenly mindedness, love to saints, to enemies, and for conformity in heart, in word, and life to his will. But where is it? Mark chapter 11, verse 22, 1 Peter 3, 16, Hebrews 13, verse 5, Philippians 4, verse 5, Matthew 10, verses 37 through 39, Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, Micah 6, verse 8, Revelation 2, 10, John 15, verse 17, 1 John 4, verse 21, Matthew 5, 44, Proverbs 23, verse 26, and Colossians 4, verse 6. For many I say unto you, these latter words carry in them a double argument to prove the truth asserted before. First, in that he directly pointeth at his followers, I say unto you. 
Many I say unto you, even to you that are my disciples, to you that have eaten, drank in my presence. I know that sometimes Christ hath directed his speech to his disciples, not so much upon their accounts as upon the accounts of others. But here it is not so. The I say unto you in this place shows it immediately concerned some of themselves. I say unto you, ye shall begin to stand without and to knock, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eat and drank in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. It is you, you, you that I mean. I say unto you, It is common with the professing people when they hear a smart and thundering sermon to say, Now has the preacher paid off the drunkard, the swearer, the lion, the covetous, and adulterer, forgetting that these sins may be committed in a spiritual and mystical way. There is a spiritual drunkenness, spiritual adultery, and a man may be a liar that calls God his father when he is not, or that calls himself a Christian and is not. Wherefore, perhaps all these thunderings and lightnings in this terrible sermon may more concern thee than thou art aware of. I say unto you, unto you, professors, may be the application of all this thunder. Revelation 2, 9 and chapter 3, verse 9. I say unto you. Had not the Lord Jesus designed by these words to show what an overthrow will one day be made among professors, he needed not have applied it at this rate as in the text and afterwards he has done. The sentence had run intelligible enough without it. I say, without his saying, I say unto you. But the truth is, the professor is in danger. The preacher and the hearer, the workers of miracles and workers of wonders, may be all in danger of damning and notwithstanding all their attainments. And to awaken us all about this truth, therefore, the text must run thus. For many, I say unto you, shall seek to enter in, and shall not be able. See you not yet that the professor is in danger, and that those words, I say unto you, are a prophecy of the everlasting perdition of some that are famous in the congregation of saints. I say, if you do not see it, pray God your eyes may be opened, and beware that thy portion be not as the portion of one of those that are wrapped up in the twenty-eighth verse of the chapter. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of heaven and you yourselves thrust out. For many I say unto you, These words I told you carry in them a double argument for confirmation of the truth asserted before. First, that professors are here particularly pointed at. And secondly, it is the saying of the truth himself. For these words, I say, are words full of authority. I say it, I say unto you, says Christ, as he saith in another place, It is I that speak. Behold, it is I. The person whose words we have now under consideration was no blundering raw-headed preacher, but the very wisdom of God, his Son, and him that hath lain in his bosom from everlasting, and consequently had the most perfect knowledge of his Father's will, and how it would fare with professors at the end of this world. And now hearken what himself doth say of the words which he hath spoken. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Matthew 24, verse 35 I say unto you, The prophet used not to speak after this manner, nor yet the holy apostles, for thus to speak is to press things to be received upon their own authority. They used to say, Thus saith the Lord, or Paul, or Peter, an apostle, or a servant of God. But now we are dealing with the words of the Son of God. It is he that hath said it. Wherefore we find the truth of the perishing of many professors asserted and confirmed by Christ's own mouth. This consideration carrieth great awakening in it, but into such a fast sleep are many nowadays fallen that nothing will awaken them but that shrill and terrible cry, Behold, the bridegroom comes, come ye out to meet him. I say unto you. There are two things upon which this assertion may be grounded. Number one, there is in the world a thing like grace that is not. Number two, there is a sin called the sin against the Holy Ghost from which there is no redemption. 
and both these things befall professors. Number one, there is in the world a thing like grace that is not. This is evident because we read that there are some that not only make a fair show in the flesh, that glory in appearance, that appear beautiful outwardly, that do as God's people, but have not the grace of God's people. Galatians 6 verse 12, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 12, Matthew 23 verse 27, and Isaiah 57 verses 2 and 3. It is evident also from those frequent cautions that are everywhere in the scriptures given us about this thing. Be not deceived. Let a man examine himself. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Galatians 6, 7, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 28, and 2 Corinthians 13, 3. All these expressions intimate to us that there may be a show of, or a thing like grace, where there is no grace indeed. Number 3. This is evident from the conclusion made by the Holy Ghost upon this very thing. For if a man thinketh himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Galatians 6, 3. The Holy Ghost here concludeth that a man may think himself to be something, may think he hath grace when he hath none, may think himself something for heaven and another world, when indeed he is just nothing at all with reference thereto. The Holy Ghost also determines upon this point, to wit, that they that do so deceive themselves. For if a man thinketh himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. He deceiveth his own soul, he deceiveth himself of heaven and salvation. So again, let no man beguile you of your reward. Colossians 2.18 Number 4 It is manifest from the text, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. Alas, great light, great parts, great works, and great confidence of heaven may be where there is no faith of God's elect, no love of the Spirit, no repentance unto salvation, no sanctification of the Spirit, and so consequently no saving grace. But secondly, as there is a thing like grace which is not, so there is a sin called the sin against the Holy Ghost, from which there is no redemption, and this sin doth more than ordinarily befall professors. There is a sin called the sin against the Holy Ghost, from which there is no redemption. This is evident both from Matthew and Mark. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor in the world to come. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Matthew 12:32 and Mark 3, verse 29. Wherefore, when we know that a man hath sinned this sin, we are not to pray for him or to have compassion on him. 1 John 15:16 and Judges chapter 22. This sin doth most ordinarily befall professors, for there are few, if any, that are not professors that are at present capable of sinning this sin. They which were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift, that were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the world to come. Hebrews 6 verses 4 and 5 Of this sort are they that commit this sin. Peter also describes them to be such that sin the unpardonable sin. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. 2 Peter 2, verse 2 The other passage in the tenth of the Hebrews holdeth forth the same thing. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation that shall devour the adversaries. Hebrews 10, verses 26 and 27 these, therefore, are the persons that are the prey for this sin. The sin feedeth upon professors, and they that are such do very often fall into the mouth of this eater. Some fall into the mouth of this sin by delusions and doctrines of devils, and some fall into the mouth of it by returning with the dog to his own vomit again, and with the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. 1 Peter 2.22 I shall not here give you a particular description of this sin, that I have done elsewhere. But such a sin there is, and they that commit it shall never have forgiveness. 
And I say again, there be professors that commit this unpardonable sin, yea, more than most are aware of. Let all therefore look about them. The Lord awaken them that they may so do. For what with the profession without grace, and by the venom of the sin against the Holy Ghost, many will seek to enter in, and shall not be able, will seek to enter in. This kingdom, at the gate of which the reprobate will be stopped, will be at the last judgment the desire of all the world. And they, especially they in my text, will seek to enter in. For then they will see that the blessedness is to those that shall get into this kingdom, according to that which is written, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates of the city. Revelation 21 verse 14 to prove that they will seek, although I have done it already, yet read these texts at your leisure. Matthew 25, verse 11, and chapter 7, verse 22, and Luke chapter 13, verse 28. And, in a word, to give you the reason why they will seek to enter in. Number one. Now they will see what a kingdom it is, what glory there is in it, and now they shall also see the blessedness which they shall have that shall then be counted worthy to enter in. The reason why this kingdom is so little regarded, it is because it is not seen. The glory of it is hid from the eyes of the world. Their eye hath not seen, nor their ear heard, etc. Ay, but then they shall hear and see too. And when this comes to pass, then, even then, he that now most seldom thinks thereof will seek to enter in. Number two. They will now see what hell is and what damnation in hell is more clear than ever. They will also see how the breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. Oh, the sight of that burning fiery furnace which is prepared for the devil and his angels. This, this will make work in the souls of castaways at that day of God Almighty, and then they will seek to enter in. Number three. Now they will see what the meaning of such words as these are, as hellfire, everlasting fire, devouring fire, fire that shall never be quenched. Now they will see what forever means, what eternity means. Now they will see what this word means, the bottomless pit. Now they will hear roaring of sinners in this place, howling in that, some crying to the mountains to fall upon them, and others to the rocks to cover them. Now they will see blessedness is nowhere, but within. Number four. Now they will see what glory the godly are possessed with, how they rest in Abraham's bosom, how they enjoy eternal glory, how they walk in their white robes and are equal to the angels. Oh, the favor and blessedness and unspeakable happiness that now God's people shall have, and this shall be seen by them that are shut out, by them that God hath rejected forever, and this will make them seek to enter in. Luke chapter 16 verses 22 and 23 and chapter 13, 28 will seek to enter in. Question. But some may say, how will they seek to enter in? Answer. Number one. They will put on all the confidence they can. They will trick and trim up their profession and adorn it with what bravery they can. Thus the foolish virgins sought to enter in. They did trim up their lamps, made themselves as fine as they could. They made shift to make their lamps to shine a while, but the Son of God discovering himself, their confidence failed, their lamps went out, the door was shut upon them, and they were kept out. Number two. They will seek to enter in by crowding themselves in among the godly. Thus the man without the wedding garment sought to enter in. He goes to the wedding, gets into the wedding chamber, sits close among the guests, and then without doubt concluded he should escape damnation. But you know one black sheep is soon seen, though it be among a hundred white ones. Why, even thus it fared with this poor man. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man that had not on a wedding garment. He spied him presently, and before one word was spoken to any of the others, he had this dreadful salutation. Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having on a wedding garment? may acknowledge his sins also. Matthew chapter 27 verse 4. Number 2. In saving repentance there is a crying out under sin. But one that hath the other repentance may cry out under sin also. Genesis 4 verse 13. 
Number three, in saving repentance there will be a humiliation for sin, and one that hath the other repentance may humble himself also. 1 Kings 21 verse 29. Number four, saving repentance is attended with self-loathing, but he that hath the other repentance may have loathing of sin too. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 22. A loathing of sin because it is sin, that he cannot have. But a loathing of sin because it is offensive to him, that he may have. The dog doth not loathe that which troubleth his stomach because it is there, but because it troubleth him. When it has done troubling him, he can turn to it again and lick it up as before it troubled him. Number five. Saving repentance is attended with prayers and tears. But he that hath none but the other repentance may have prayers and tears also. Genesis chapter 27 verses 34 and 35 and Hebrews 12 verses 14 through 16. Number six. In saving repentance there is fear and reverence of the word and ministers that bring it. But this may be also where there is none but the repentance that is not saving. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and holy, and observed him. When he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Mark chapter 6, verse 20. Number 7. Saving repentance makes a man's heart very tender of doing anything against the word of God. But Balaam could say, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord. Numbers chapter 24, verse 13. Behold then how far a man may go in repentance and yet be short of that which is called repentance unto salvation not to be repented of. 1. He may be awakened. 2. He may acknowledge his sin. 3. He may cry out under the burden of sin. 4. He may have humility for it. 5. He may loathe it. 6. May have prayers and tears against it. 7. May delight to do many things of God. 8 may be afraid of sinning against him, and after all this may perish for want of saving repentance. Secondly, have they that shall be saved faith? Why, they that shall not be saved may have faith also, yea, a faith in many things so like the faith that saveth that they can hardly be distinguished, though they differ both in root and branch. To come to particulars. Number one. Saving faith hath Christ for its object, and so may the faith have that is not saving. Those very Jews of whom it is said they believed on Christ, Christ tells them, and that after their believing, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. John chapter 8 verses 30 through 44. Number 2. Saving faith is wrought by the word of God, and so may the faith be that is not saving. Luke chapter 8 verse 13. Number three, saving faith looks for justification without works, and so may a faith do that is not saving. James 2 verse 18. Number four, saving faith will sanctify and purify the heart, and the faith that is not saving may work a man off from the pollutions of the world, as it did Judas, Demas, and others. See Second Peter chapter 2. Number five, Saving faith will give a man tastes of the world to come, and also joy by those tastes, and so will the faith do that is not saving. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 4 and 5, and Luke chapter 8 verse 13. Number 6. Saving faith will help a man, if called thereto, to give his body to be burned for his religion, and so will the faith do that is not saving. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 through 5. Number seven, saving faith will help a man to look for an inheritance in the world to come, and that may the faith do that is not saving. All those virgins took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Matthew 25, verse 1. Number eight, saving faith will not only make a man look for, but prepare to meet the bridegroom, and so may the faith do that is not saving. Then all these virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Matthew 25, verse 7. Number 9. Saving faith will make a man look for an interest in the kingdom of heaven with confidence, and the faith that is not saving will even demand entrance of the Lord. Lord, Lord, open unto us. Matthew 25, verse 11. 
Number 10. Saving faith will have good works follow it into heaven, and the faith that is not saving may have great works follow it as far as to the heaven gates. Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done wondrous works? Matthew chapter 7 verse 22. Now then, if the faith that is not saving may have Christ for its object, be wrought by the word, look for justification without works, work men off from the pollutions of the world, and give men tastes of and joy in the things of another world. I say again, if it will help a man to burn for his judgment and look for an inheritance in another world, yea, if it will help a man to prepare for it, claim interest in it, and if it can carry great works, many great and glorious works as far as heaven's gates, then no marvel if abundance of people take this faith for the saving faith, and so fall short of heaven thereby. Alas, friends, there are but few that can produce such for repentance, and such faith as yet you see I have proved even reprobates have had in several ages of the church. But, thirdly, they that go to heaven are a praying people, but a man may pray that shall not be saved. Pray, he may pray, pray daily. Yea, he may ask of God the ordinances of justice, and may take delight in approaching to God. Nay, further, such souls may, as it were, cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying out. Isaiah chapter 28 verse 2 and Malachi chapter 12 verse 13. Fourthly, do God's people keep holy fasts? They that are not his people may keep fasts also, may keep fasts often, even twice a week. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Luke chapter 16 verses 11 and 12 I might enlarge upon things, but I intend but a little book. I do not question, but many Balaamites will appear before the judgment seat to condemnation, men that have had visions of God and that knew the knowledge of the Most High, men that have had the Spirit of God come upon them and that have by that been made other men. Yet these shall go to the generations of their fathers, they shall never see light. Numbers chapter 24 verses 2, 4 and 16 and 1 Samuel 10 verses 6 and 10 in Psalm 49 verse 19 I read of some men whose excellency in religion mounts up to the heavens and their heads reach unto the clouds who yet shall perish forever like their very refuse and he that in this world hath seen them shall say at the judgment where are they Job 20 verses 5 through 7 there will be many a one that were gallant professors in this world be wanting among the saved in the day of Christ's coming yea, many whose damnation was never dreamed of. Which of the twelve ever thought that Judas would have proved a devil? Nay, when Christ suggested that one among them was not, they each were more afraid of themselves than of him. Matthew 26, verses 21 through 23. Who questioned the salvation of the foolish virgins? The wise ones did not. They gave them the privilege of communion with themselves. Matthew 25. The discerning of the heart and the infallible proof of the truth of saving grace is reserved to the judgment of Jesus Christ at his coming. The church and best of saints sometimes hit and sometimes miss in their judgments about this matter. And the cause of our missing in our judgment is, number one, partly because we cannot infallibly, at all times, distinguish grace that saveth from that which doth but appear to do so. Number two, Partly also because some men have the art to give right names to wrong things. Number three. And partly because we being commanded to receive him that is weak are afraid to exclude the least Christian, by which means hypocrites creep into the churches. But what saith the scripture? I the Lord search the heart, I try the reins. And again, all the churches shall know that I am he that searches the reins and hearts and I will give to every one of you according to his works. Jeremiah 11 verse 20 and chapter 17 verse 10 and also Revelation chapter 2 verse 23. To this searcher of hearts is the time of infallible discerning reserved 
and then you shall see how far grace that is not saving hath gone, and also how few will be saved indeed. The Lord awakened poor sinners by these warnings and cautions. I come now to make some brief use and application of the whole, and my first word shall be to the openly profane. For sinner, thou readest here that but a few will be saved, that many that expect heaven will go without heaven. What sayest thou to this poor sinner? Let me say it over again. There are but few to be saved, but very few. Let me add but few professors, but few eminent professors. What sayest thou now, sinner? If judgment begins at the house of God, what will the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? This is Peter's question. Canst thou answer it, sinner? Yea, I say again, if judgment must begin at them, will it not make thee think, What shall become of me? And I add, When thou shalt see the stars of heaven to tumble down to hell, canst thou think that such a muck heap of sin as thou art shall be lifted up to heaven? Peter asked thee another question, to wit, If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinners appear? 1 Peter 4, verse 18 Canst thou answer this question, sinner? Stand among the righteous thou mayest not. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Psalm 1, verse 5 Stand among the wicked thou then wilt not dare to do. Where wilt thou appear, sinner? To stand among the hypocrites will avail thee nothing. The hypocrite shall not come before him, that is, with acceptance, but shall perish. Job 13, verse 16 because it concerns thee much, let me over with it again. When thou shalt see less sinners than thou art, bound up by angels in bundles to burn them, where wilt thou appear, sinner? Thou mayest wish thyself another man, but that will not help thee, sinner. Thou mayest wish, would I had been converted in time, but that will not help thee neither. And if, like the wife of Jeroboam, thou should feign thyself to be another woman, the prophet, the Lord Jesus, would soon find thee out. What wilt thou do, poor sinner? Heavy tidings, heavy tidings will attend thee, except thou repent, poor sinner. 1 Kings 14, verses 2, 5, and 6, and Luke 13, verses 3 and 5. Oh, the dreadful state of a poor sinner, of an open, profane sinner! Everybody that hath but common sense knows that this man is in the broad way to death, yet he laughs at his own damnation. Shall I come to particulars with thee? Number one. Poor unclean sinner, the harlot's house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Proverbs 2, verse 18, and chapter 5, verse 5, and chapter 7, verse 27. Number two. Poor swearing and thievish sinner, God hath prepared the curse that every one that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it. And every one that sweareth shall be cut off on that side according to it. Zechariah 5 verse 3 Number 3 Poor drunken sinner, what shall I say to thee? Woe to the drunkards of Ephraim! Woe to them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strong drink! They shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Isaiah 28 verse 1 and chapter 5 verse 22 and 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10. Number 4. Poor covetous worldly man, God's word says, that the covetous the Lord abhorreth, that the covetous man is an idolater, and that the covetous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Psalm 10, verse 3, Ephesians 5, verse 5, John 2, verse 15, and 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10. Number 5. And thou liar, what wilt thou do? All liars shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. Revelation 21, verses 8 and 27. I shall not enlarge, poor sinner, let no man deceive thee. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Ephesians 5, verse 6. I will therefore give thee a short call, and so leave thee. Sinner, awake. Yea, I say unto thee, awake. Sin lieth at thy door, and God's axe lieth at thy root, and hellfire is right underneath thee. I say again, Awake! Every tree, therefore, that bringeth not forth good fruit, is hewn down, and cast into the fire. 
Genesis 4, verse 7, and Matthew 3, verse 10. For sinner, awake. Eternity is coming and his son. They are both coming to judge the world. Awake, art yet asleep, poor sinner? Let me set the trumpet to thine ear once again. The heavens will be shortly on a burning flame. The earth and the works thereof shall be burned up, and then wicked men shall go into perdition. Dost thou hear this, sinner? Second Peter chapter 3 Hark again, the sweet morsels of sins will then be fled and gone, and the bitter burning fruits of them only left. What sayest thou now, sinner? Canst thou drink hellfire? Will the wrath of God be a pleasant dish to thy taste? This must be thine every day's meat and drink in hell, for sinner. I will yet propound to thee God's ponderous question, and then for this time leave thee. Can thine heart endure, or can thine hands be strong in the day that I shall deal with thee, saith the Lord? Ezekiel 22, verse 14 What sayest thou? Wilt thou answer this question now, or wilt thou take time to do it? Or wilt thou be desperate and venture all? And let me put this text in thine ear to keep it open, and so the Lord will have mercy upon thee. Upon the wicked shall the Lord rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. Psalm 11, verse 6. Repent, sinners, repent. Secondly, my second word is to them that are upon the potter's wheel, concerning whom we know not, as yet, whether their convictions and awakenings will end in conversion or not. Several things I shall say to you, both to further your convictions and to caution you from staying anywhere below or short of saving grace. Number one. Remember that but few shall be saved, and if God should count thee worthy to be one of that few, what a mercy would that be? Number two. Be thankful, therefore, for convictions. Conversion begins at conviction, though all conviction does not end in conversion. It is a great mercy to be convinced that we are sinners and that we need a Savior. Count it, therefore, a mercy, and that thy convictions may end in conversion. Do thou, number one, Take heed of stifling them. It is the way of poor sinners to look upon convictions as things that are hurtful and therefore they use to shun the awakening ministry and to check a convincing conscience. Such poor sinners are much like to the wanton boy that stands at the maid's elbow to blow out her candle as fast as she lights it at the fire. Convinced sinner, God lighteth thy candle and thou puttest it out. God lights it again and thou puttest it out. Yea, how oft is the candle of the wicked put out. Job 21, verse 17. At last God resolveth he will light thy candle no more, and then like the Egyptians you will dwell all your days in darkness and never see light more, but by the light of hellfire. Wherefore give glory to God, and if he awakens thy conscience, quench not thy convictions. Do it, saith the prophet, because he caused darkness, and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains, and he turn your convictions into the shadow of death, and make them gross darkness. Jeremiah 13, verse 16 Number 1 Be willing to see the worst of thy condition. It is better to see it here than in hell, for thou must see thy misery here or there. Number 2 Beware of little sins. They will make way for great ones, and they again will make way for bigger upon which God's wrath will follow, and then may thy latter end be worse than thy beginning. Second Peter 2, verse 20. Number 3. Take heed of bad company and evil communication, for they will corrupt good manners. God saith evil company will turn thee away from following him, and will tempt thee to serve other gods, devils. So the anger of the Lord will be kindled against thee and destroy thee suddenly. Deuteronomy 7, verse 4. Number 4. Beware of such a thought as bids thee delay repentance, for that is damnable. Proverbs 1, verse 24, and Zechariah 7, verses 12 and 13. Number 5. Beware of taking example by some poor carnal professors whose religion lies in the tip of his tongue. Beware, I say, of the man whose head swims with notions, but his life is among the unclean. Job 36, verse 14. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Proverbs 13, verse 20. Number 6. 
Give thyself much to the word and prayer and good conference. Number seven, labor to see the sin that cleaveth to the best of thy performances and know that all is nothing if thou beest not found in Jesus Christ. Number eight, keep in remembrance that God's eye is upon thy heart and upon all thy ways. Can any hide himself in secret places that I should not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? Jeremiah 23:24. Be often meditating upon death and judgment, Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9, and chapter 12, verse 14. Number 10. Be often thinking what a dreadful end sinners that have neglected Christ will make at that day of death and judgment, Hebrews 10, verse 31. Number 11. Put thyself often in thy thoughts before Christ's judgment seat, in thy sins, and consider with thyself, were I now before my judge, how should I look, how should I shake and tremble? Number 12. Be often thinking of them that are now in hell past all mercy. I say, be often thinking of them. Thus, number 1. They were once in the world as I now am. Two, they once took delight in sin, as I have done. Three, they once neglected repentance, as Satan would have me do. Four, but now they are gone, now they are all in hell, now the pit hath shut her mouth upon them. Thou mayest also double thy thoughts of the damned thus. Number one, if these poor creatures were in the world again, would they sin as they did before? Would they neglect salvation as they did before? Number two, If they had sermons as I have, if they had the Bible as I have, if they had good company as I have, yea, if they had a day of grace as I have, would they neglect it as they did before? Sinner, couldst thou soberly think of these things, they might help to awaken thee and to keep thee awake to repentance, to the repentance that is to salvation, never to be repented of. Objection. But you have said few shall be saved and some that go a great way, yet are not saved. At this, therefore, I am even discouraged and disheartened. I think I had as good go no further. I am indeed under conviction, but I may perish, and if I go on in my sins, I can but perish. And it is ten, twenty, and hundred to one, if I be saved, should I be never so earnest for heaven. Answer. That few will be saved must needs be a truth, for Christ hath said it. That many go far and come short of heaven is as true, being testified by the same hand. But what then? Why then had I as good never seek? Who told thee so? Must nobody seek because few are saved? This is just contrary to the text that bids us therefore strive. Strive to enter in because the gate is straight and because many will seek to enter in and shall not be able. But why go back again, seeing that is the nearest way to hell? Never go over hedge and ditch to hell. If I must needs go thither, I will go the farthest way about. But who can tell, though there should not be saved so many as there shall, but thou mayest be but one of the few. They that miss of life perish, because they will not let go of their sins, or because they take up a profession short of the saving faith of the gospel. They perish, I say, because they are content with such things as will not prove graces of a saving nature when they come to be tried in the fire. Otherwise the promise is free and full and everlasting. Him that cometh to me, says Christ, I will in no wise cast out. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him might not perish but have everlasting life. John chapter 6 verse 37 Wherefore, let not this thought, few shall be saved, weaken thy heart, but let it cause thee to mend thy pace, to mend thy cries, to look well to thy grounds for heaven. Let it make thee fly faster from sin to Christ. Let it keep thee awake and out of carnal security, and thou mayest be saved. Thirdly, my third word is to professors. Sirs, give me leave to set my trumpet to your ears again a little. When every man hath put in all the claim they can for heaven, but few will have it for their inheritance. I mean, but few professors, for so the text intends. And so I have also proved. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. 
Let me therefore a little expostulate the matter with you, O ye thousands of professors. Number one. I begin with you whose religion lieth only in your tongues. I mean you who are little or nothing known from the rest of the rabble of the world. Only you can talk better than they. Hear me a word or two. If I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not charity, that is, love to God and Christ and saints and holiness, I am nothing, no child of God, and so have nothing to do with heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 A prating tongue will not unlock the gates of heaven, nor blind the eyes of thy judge. Look to it, the wise in heart will receive commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. Proverbs 10 verse 8 Number 2. Covetous professors, thou that makest a gain of religion, thou usest thy profession to bring grist to thy mill, look to it also. Gain is not godliness. Judas's religion lay much in the bag, but his soul is now burning in hell. All covetousness is idolatry. But what is that, or what will you call it, when men are religious for filthy lucre's sake? Ezekiel 33 verse 31. Number three, wanton professors, I have a word for you. I mean you that can tell how to misplead scripture to maintain your pride, your banqueting, and abominable idolatry. Read what Peter says. You are the snare and damnation of others. You will lure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. Second Peter 2 verse 18. Besides, the Holy Ghost hath a great deal against you for your feastings and eating without fear, not for health, but gluttony. Jude, verse 12. Farther, Peter says, that you that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime are spots and blemishes, sporting yourselves with your own deceivings. Second Peter 2, verse 14. And let me ask, did God give his word to justify your wickedness, or doth grace teach you to plead for the flesh? or the making provision of the lust thereof. Of these also are they that feed their bodies to strengthen their lusts, under pretense of strengthening frail nature. But pray remember the text, Many I say unto you will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. Number four. I come next to the opinionist, I mean to him whose religion lieth in some circumstantials of religion. With this sort this kingdom swarms at this day, these think all out of the way that are not of their mode, when themselves may be out of the way in the midst of their zeal for their opinions. Pray, do you also observe the text? Many, I say unto you, seek to enter in, and shall not be able. Number five. Neither is the formalist exempted from this number. He is a man that hath lost all but the shell of religion. He is hot indeed for his form, and no marvel, for that is his all to contend for. But his form, being without the power and spirit of godliness, it will leave him in his sins. Nay, he standeth now in them in the sight of God, 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, and is one of the many that will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Number 6. The legalist comes next, even him that hath no life but what he makes out of his duties. This man hath chosen to stand and fall by Moses, who is the condemner of the world. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. John 5, 45 Number 7 There is in the next place the libertine, he that pretends to be against forms and duties as things that gender to bondage, neglecting the order of God. This man pretends to pray always, but under that pretense prays not at all. He pretends to keep every day a Sabbath, but this pretense serves him only to cast off all set times for the worship of God. This is also one of the many that will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Titus 1 verse 16 Number 8 There is the temporizing latitudinarian. He is a man that hath no God but his belly, nor any religion but that by which his belly is worshipped. His religion is always, like the times, turning this way and that way like the cock on the steeple. Neither hath he any conscience but a benumbed and seared one, and is next door to a downright atheist, and also is one of the many that will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Number 9. There is also the willfully ignorant professor 
or him that is afraid to know more for fear of the cross. He is for picking and choosing of truth and loveth not to hazard his all for that worthy name by which he would be called. When he is at any time overset by arguments or awakenings of conscience, he uses to heal all by, I was not brought up in this faith, as if it were unlawful for Christians to know more than hath been taught them at first conversion. There are many scriptures that lie against this man as the mouths of great guns, and he is one of the many that will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Number 10. We will add to all these the professor that would prove himself a Christian by comparing himself with others instead of comparing himself with the word of God. This man comforts himself because he is as holy as such and such. He also knows as much as that old professor and then concludes he shall go to heaven, as if he certainly knew that those with whom he compares himself would be undoubtedly saved. But how if he should be mistaken? Nay, may they not both fall short? But to be sure, he is in the wrong that hath made the comparison. Second Corinthians 10 verses 12 And a wrong foundation will not stand in the day of judgment. This man, therefore, is one of the many that will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Number 11. There is yet another professor, and he is for God and for Baal, too. He can be anything for any company. He can throw stones with both hands. His religion alters as fast as his company. He is a frog of Egypt and can live in the water and out of water. He can live in religious company and again as well as out. Nothing that is disorderly comes amiss to him. He will hold with the hare and run with the hound. He carries fire in the one hand and water in the other. He is a very anything but what he should be. This is also one of the many that will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Number 12. There is also that free willer who denies to the Holy Ghost the soul work in conversion. And that Sosanian who denieth to Christ that he hath made to God satisfaction for sin and that Quaker who takes from Christ the two natures in his person. And I might add as many more touching whose damnation, they dying as they are, the scripture is plain. These will seek to enter in and shall not be able. But fourthly, if it be so, what a strange disappointment will many professors meet with at the day of judgment. I speak not now to the openly profane, Everybody, as I have said, that hath but common understanding between good and evil, knows that they are in the broad way to hell and damnation, and they must needs come thither. Nothing can hinder it but repentance unto salvation, except God should prove a liar to save them, and it is hard venturing of that. Neither is it amiss if we take notice of the examples that are briefly mentioned in the scriptures concerning professors that have miscarried. Number one. Judas perished from among the apostles, Acts 1. Number 2. Demas, as I think, perished from among the evangelists, 2 Timothy 4, verse 9. 3. Diotrephes from among the ministers, or them in the office of the church, John 10. Number 4. And as for Christian professors, they have fallen by heaps and almost by whole churches, 2 Timothy 1, verse 15, and Revelation 3, verses 4, and 15 through 17. Number 5. Let us add to these that the things mentioned in the scriptures about these matters are but brief hints and items of what is afterwards to happen. As the apostle said, some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. 1 Timothy 5, verse 24. So that, fellow professors, let us fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into this rest any of us should seem to come short of it. Oh, to come short, nothing kills like it, nothing will burn like it. I intend not discouragements, but awakenings. The churches have need of awakening, and so have all professors. Do not despise me, therefore, but hear me over again. What a strange disappointment will many professors meet with at the day of God Almighty. A disappointment, I say, and that as to several things. Number one, they will look to escape hell and yet fall just into the mouth of hell. What a disappointment will here be. Number two, they will look for heaven, but the gate of heaven will be shut against them. What a disappointment is here. Three, 
They will expect that Christ should have compassion for them, but will find that he has shut up all the bowels of compassion from them. What a disappointment is here. And, fifthly, as this disappointment will be fearful, so certainly it will be full of very amazement. Number one, will it not amaze them to be unexpectedly excluded from life and salvation? Two, will it not be amazing to them to see their own madness and folly while they consider how they have dallied with their own souls and took lightly for granted that they had that grace that would save them and have left them in a damnable state? Number three, will they not also be amazed one at another while they remember how in their lifetime they counted themselves fellow heirs of life? To allude to that of the prophet, they shall be amazed one of another, their faces shall be as flames. Isaiah 13, verse 8. Number 4. Will it not be amazing to some of the damned themselves to see some come to hell that then they shall see come thither? To see preachers of the word, professors of the word, practicers of the word to come thither. What wondering was there among them at the fall of the king of Babylon since he thought to have swallowed up all because he was run down by the Medes and Persians. How art thou fallen from heaven, Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cast down to the ground that didst weaken the nations? If such a thing as this will with amazement surprise the damned, what an amazement will it be to them to see such a one as he, whose head reached to the clouds, to see him come down to the pit and perish forever like very dross? Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. Isaiah chapter 14 They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man? Is this he that professed and disputed and forsook us, but now he is coming to us again? Is this he that separated from us but now is he fallen with us into the same eternal damnation with us. Sixthly, yet again one word more, if I may awaken professors. Number one, consider, though the poor carnal world shall certainly perish, yet they will want these things to aggravate their sorrow, which thou wilt meet with in every thought that thou wilt have of the condition thou wast in when thou wast in the world. Number one, they will not have a profession to bite them when they come thither. Two, they will not have a taste of a lost heaven to bite them when they come thither. Three, they will not have the thoughts of, I was almost at heaven, to bite them when they come thither. Four, they will not have the thoughts of, how they cheated saints, ministers, churches, to bite them when they come thither. Five, they will not have the dying thoughts of false faith, false hope, false repentance and false holiness to bite them when they come thither. I was at the gates of heaven. I looked into heaven. I thought I should have entered into heaven. Oh, how will these things sting? They will, if I may call them so, be the sting of the sting of death in hellfire. Seventhly, give me leave now in a word to give you a little advice. One, dost thou love thine own soul? Then pray to Jesus Christ for an awakened heart for an heart so awakened with all the things of another world, that thou mayest be allured to Jesus Christ. 2. When thou comest there, beg again for more awakenings about sin, hell, grace, and about the righteousness of Christ. 3. Cry also for a spirit of discerning, that thou mayest know that which is saving grace indeed. 4. Above all studies, apply thyself to the study of those things that show thee the evil of sin, the shortness of man's life, and which is the way to be saved. 5. Keep company with the most godly among professors. 6. When thou hearest what the nature of true grace is, defer not to ask thine own heart if this grace be there. And here take heed, 1. That the preacher himself be sound and of good life. Two, that thou takest not seeming graces for real ones, nor seeming fruits for real fruits. Three, take heed that a sin in thy life goes not unrepented of, for that will make a flaw in thine evidence, a wound in thy conscience, and a breach in thy peace. And a hundred to one, if at last it doth not drive all the grace in thee into so dark a corner of thy heart, 
that thou shalt not be able for a time by all the torches that are burning in the gospel to find it out to thine own comfort and consolation.